So this is chapter 36, and uh, chapter 36 in this book uh, is dealing with plant form, basically the structure of plants with some basic uh, physiology. This is uh, chapter 36 in the 11th edition. Uh, the first section is going to do an overview of the plant form. And to be honest with you, this the emphasis of this chapter is really going to be with the tracheophytes or the vascular plants uh, that we've seen a little bit about. Uh, there on uh, in the laboratory already, uh, and uh, for the most most of the examples are also going to come from the flowering plants, so not just the vascular plants, but the angiosperms uh, are going to be some big examples here. So uh, it's not that the uh, uh, more primitive plants are not as important; we're just there's just more emphasis uh, on these more uh, or the higher plants or the uh, the ones that are more dominant today. So the learning objectives for section one which is the overview, uh, is to describe the functions of the basic types of plant tissues. And we're going to see that there's three types there. And we're also going to look at uh, why the meristems, which is a structural feature of the plants, are, are, are vital uh, to, uh, uh, after generations, would be vital to growth and development of the plant. And then we're going to look at uh, what the origins are uh, for what we'll uh, learn is primary growth and secondary growth. Uh, primary growth should be growth in uh, the length of uh, stems and roots, uh, whereas uh, secondary growth is going to be growth in uh, in the diameter of those structures. And we'll see that only certain kinds of plants can do secondary growth. So uh, let's take a look at our overview here. Uh, vascular plants are going to consist of roots, which are below ground, and the shoots, which are above ground. Now, recall that roots uh, basically are going to help anchor the plant in position and help support it. And those roots are also going to absorb water and solutes from the soil. And solutes include ions. Uh, for example, they might be absorbing calcium or, uh, or uh, some uh, other important uh, nutrients from the soil. Uh, the shoot system is going to be uh, the above ground parts, and those include the supporting stems, uh, photosynthetic structures like leaves, and even uh, reproductive structures like flowers and cones, uh, if we're talking about pine trees. Uh, what we'll see is that the above ground parts are going to consist of repetitive units, uh, and we'll take a look at what those are. They include things like nodes and internodes. But let's just take a look at this diagram here. This diagram also appears in your lab manual, and you can see they have the soil represented here, uh, and the below ground structures are the roots, and the above ground are the shoots. Uh, and you can see in this example here, you have a main root or primary root, and then you have these branching uh, lateral roots there. And then for the shoots, you have your stems coming up here, and you have these leaves in every node. So there would be a node right there and a node right there. And I know it looks like several leaves, but this is a special kind of uh, structure of a leaf called a compound leaf. Uh, the entire thing is the leaf. It just has small little leaflets on there. So this is the main uh, stem or, or structure that helps hold the leaf onto the plant, and that's called a petiole, which we see the name there. Uh, the, the, the rest of the leaf contains the photosynthetic part that's called uh, the blade, and uh, within the leaf you're going to have veins, and these veins contain vascular tissues uh, overall. And... Um, and then we have uh, the space between the nodes where one leaf is and the next one. That's called the internode. And at every location where we have a leaf leaving uh, the stem, right in there, there's going to be a little axillary bud. And that axillary bud would be a place where either flowers might grow or a branch of the stem. So then branches would arise from these axillary buds there. Uh, and then... Uh, at the very, very top and the bottom, we have these apexes uh, here, the shoot apex at the top, which is going to be important for uh, increasing the length of these uh, stems, and then the root apex, which is going to be important for increasing the length of the roots. Uh, so we're going to see these structures again in more detail as we go through the rest of the chapter. Um, when it comes to building a plant, uh, the basic structural unit uh, is the same for any living thing. It's the cells. So the plant cells can be, be distinguished based on various attributes, uh, just how big their storage vacuoles are. Remember that plants have these large uh, central vacuoles here. We're also uh, going to be able to distinguish plant cells based on whether or not they're alive or they're not alive when they mature to their final function.
for example, there's a special tissue in uh, that conducts water through the plant uh, called uh, xylem, and the cells that made the xylem are dead when they're functioning. So when water is moving through the xylem, the cells are dead and all that's left is basically the structures built by the living cell uh, just before it matured and died. Whereas other cells are very much alive and they're functioning. It seems kind of odd to think of cells uh, functioning even though they're not alive anymore. Uh, and then we can also uh, look and distinguish among cells based on how thick their cell walls are. Uh, and the cell wall is produced by the living cell inside. So the components of the cell uh, wall are going to be taken to the outside of the plasma membrane. So the cell walls are always on the outside. And remember that cell walls in plants are made of a uh, complex carbohydrate called uh, cellulose. And cellulose is just a complex carbohydrate made of uh, numerous glucose molecules. And here we have just a primary cell wall. This is the first cell wall that's laid down. And so the cell wall wouldn't be very thick, but in some cells, you're going to have a much thicker cell wall. And after the primary cell wall is produced, which is on the outside, then we're going to make more cell wall. And that new cell wall that's in there would be the secondary cell wall. And so here, you'd have a more, much more uh, strong and rigid structure of the cell wall. So these are ways that we can distinguish among some of the cell types that we find in plants. Uh, and then, of course, when cells come together to function, uh, these uh, types of tissues uh, are going to be organized in a certain way that we can identify them. Uh, and there's three basic types of these tissues. There's a dermal tissue, uh, and the dermal tissue is uh, going to be kind of like our skin uh, in that it protects us. It's the boundary uh, between the inside of our bodies and the outside. So it's an outer protective layer. Uh, for example, our skin is called the epidermis, and the dermal tissue that protects the plant is also uh, referred to as epidermis. And then we're going to have ground tissue, and ground tissue will have uh, uh, various functions, including storing uh, materials, for example, storage of starch, uh, photosynthesis, uh, special cells, for example, in the leaves, and then some cells are going to be involved in secreting uh, products that they make within the cell. And then the third kind of tissue, so we have dermal uh, ground, and then we have vascular tissue. And vascular tissue is conducting tissue. And this is going to uh, conduct water and dissolved substances in there. So it's really it's water-based material, uh, but the fluid itself is those dissolved substances within there. Uh, dissolved substances might be like uh, sugars, uh, um, hormones and uh, minerals that are moving uh, through the plant organs along this vascular tissue. Uh, so uh, every structure within the plant, whether it's root uh, or stems or leaves, are going to have all three of these tissue types in there. And these tissue types are going to extend along the entire plant from the roots all the way up to the shoots. Uh, so uh, an important uh, part of, of the plant growth uh, and development is associated with special cell types called meristem cells. Uh, and meristem cells are kind of like uh, plants version of stem cells. These cells are not functioning yet. Uh, they have all the genetic instructions to form any kind of cell type. And as these uh, meristem cells, so we're, you're going to have collections of the meristem cells, for example, at the apex of the shoot or the apex of the root, the very tips there. As those cells divide, one cell, uh, as you divide, you're going to get two identical cells genetically. Uh, one cell will remain undifferentiated as a meristem cell, uh, merist, meristem cell, and the other one is going to begin to go down a path of differentiation. For example, this blue cell here may go down a path of differentiation to become uh, dermal tissue. Uh, so, And how that happens is you're just going to switch on a different set of genes that are located in every one of the cells. The same kind of genes are there. It's just how do you make a different cell? Turn on a different set of genes and the uh, cells start to behave differently and even look differently and behave differently. Uh, and so you can see those meristem cells, you're always going to keep one meristem cell as you divide and then the other one goes down a path of differentiation. This one may be going down the path to differentiate to form vascular tissue, for example. Uh, and another one may go down a path to form ground tissue. Uh, so these uh, meristem cells are going to be found in, um, in the apical meristems, and they're also going to be found in uh, uh, what we're going to call uh, in a little bit later lateral meristems. And not all plants have lateral meristems, but lateral meristems are going to be the locations where uh, the thickness or the diameter of 
uh, branches and uh, roots and so on get uh, thicker. So that's the secondary growth. Uh, so here, looking at the apical meristems, uh, so if, uh, we looked at the picture on the right, they kind of color-coded one on the left. Uh, and on the right, looks more like a, a, a real stained uh, specimen that you might see in the laboratory. So if we look here at the shoot apex there at the end of this uh, stem here, and we look up here at the very, very inside portion, at the very, very tip, this location right there would be where your meristem cells are. So there's your apical meristem. And as those cells divide, some of the cells, the, the cells are going to... Um, uh, stay behind and meristem cells will stay at the tip and cause the shoot to grow in like this way. The cells that stay behind start to go through that differentiation. So they go down those paths of differentiation to form vascular tissue, to form uh, ground tissue, to form uh, uh, epidermal tissue. And you start to have certain uh, plant organs begin to form. So as the stem below here begins to mature, you're starting to see little young leaves. We're going to call those leaf primordia. Uh, I think you may have already seen a slide of this uh, shoot tip for a plant called coleus, uh, which is the genus. Uh, it's a common uh, plant that uh, people like to keep at their houses. And as you go further and further back down the stem, the leaves are uh, becoming, uh, the primordia are becoming older and, begin, uh, and going through different uh, 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 development to form mature leaves. So at this point here, the primordia, they don't have all the mature tissues yet. They don't have fully functioning vascular tissue. Those cells are still going to be going through differentiation. Uh, so this would be what's going on in the shoot uh, apical meristem. And if we go to the root, the root has an apical meristem as well. And so we're going to find that meristem in these cells that are right around here. And as those cells divide, they're going to uh, uh, be left behind here as the uh, root tip begins to grow further down into the soil. Uh, so remember that one of the cells after every division is going to say meristem and the other one is going to go down those paths of differentiation. And the roots are going to have vascular tissue, ground tissue, and uh, epidermal tissue as well. Now some of the cells that arise from these divisions include cells that are going to produce this root cap here. And that root cap has uh, some functions there uh, and there's uh, there's different cell types in there uh, one of the cell types is about protecting the the root tip because the delicate cells of the meristem can be damaged as you're pushing through the soil uh, and other cells in there are sensitive to gravity uh, which keeps the root growing downward uh, so they're capable of uh, responding to the direction of gravity uh, overall uh, so um, uh, that's uh, 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 but the root cap does. So when we look at uh, the apical meristems, uh, my slide accidentally advanced there. When we look at the apical meristems, uh, these apical meristems, when they divide, and that one stem cell divides and it forms and keeps the stem cell, and the other cell uh, becomes goes down a path of differentiation, it's not quite a mature cell yet. It still has more dividing to do. And those cells are going to continue to divide. As they divide, they're going to start going down different paths of differentiation to form different cell types of these general tissues. Uh, so we're, since they're not fully functioning yet, they still have to differentiate further. We're still going to call those meristems. Okay? So the initial meristem cell can turn into any one of the cell types. And then each, uh, in each division, some of the cells are going to start going down certain paths, and those paths include these three primary meristem type cells. So we're not talking about the initial meristem, we're talking about a sub-meristem that now has gone down a narrower path. It can no longer become just any kind of cell. So one of those narrow paths is the primary meristem called protoderm. Okay, And protoderm will eventually produce cells that form cells of the epidermis, which is the outer covering. Another path would be uh, a submeristem cell called procambium, uh, procambrium, and that procambrium is going to produce uh, ultimately produce cells that make up vascular tissue, which includes cell types like phloem cells, uh, found, cells found in the phloem, phloem, and cells that are found in the xylem. Those cell types have specific names, uh, which we'll see when we get there. Uh, and then um, we have another primary meristem. Uh, where the cell is now going down the path of ground tissue. So the ground meristem is going to form uh, cells that make up ground tissue cells. Uh, so if we look over here at the diagram on the right, and I'm going to zoom in, and I'm not going to be able to draw uh, 
for uh, uh, once I zoom in. But let's say we take one of the tips of the stems there at the top. So we're at the apex. And we have the meristem there. And so we're going to see what happens here in this image right here. And the same is going to be true for uh, the root apex, apical meristem. And so we're going to look at uh, what happens here. And so we're going to look uh, in these diagrams, these ideal drawings for these three uh, primary meristem tissues. Uh, so right up here, uh, let's see, where's my my marker here. So right up here is, this is that tip that we were drawing earlier in the little meristem tissues right there. And so what we're going to do is, after those first divisions, where we've started to go down these paths, we're going to have to take a section uh, that is just a little bit lower, say right through there, just below where the meristem is. Uh, and when we do that, we take the cross section, we're going to be looking at this picture right here. Okay. So we're going to be looking at that uh, shoot and cross section. And the same thing is going to happen down here. Our meristem cells are right there. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a cross section just a little bit above that uh, to take a look at a cross section to look for some of those uh, primary meristem uh, tissues there. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in. And when we look uh, up more closely there and in the cross section right here, you can see the procambrium, uh, procambium there in the middle. And that procambium there is going to eventually form vascular tissue. And then uh, between that procambium and the outer uh, uh, layer of cells, you're going to have that ground meristem. It's not mature meristem, but those cells are going to become uh, cells as ground tissue. And then not labeled is the outer layer of cells. Those would be the protoderm, which will eventually become epidermal cells. And if we go down to the bottom, we're going to see the same situation. Uh, there's no difference. Uh, when we section through that area and we look at the primary meristems, there's your crocambium, cro procambium, and there's your ground meristem, and then the outer layer would be the proto, uh, protoderm. Uh, so um, uh, uh, a little side note here that uh, there's another kind of meristem uh, besides the apical meristems that help with primary growth. By the way, all of this is primary growth. This is just how the plant develops and grows in length. So when we talk about primary growth, that's just increasing the length of the roots and the shoots. Uh, there's another way that uh, certain kinds of plants can grow in length, uh, and they involve another kind of meristem that's found right where the nodes are, where the leaves are located, and these are going to be called intercalary meristems. And examples of plants that have these intercalary meristems are the horsetails uh, and corn. And corn is actually a member of the grass family, so we're talking about grasses in general. So if I were to draw a quick stem uh, right here, let's say maybe this is maybe a kind of grass. So there's a, a grass blade of leaf there. So that's one node where that leaf is coming out. And here's another node where the leaf's arising. So this would be the nodal region right here and the next node. And then between there, we have our internode. Right? And between that internode, at right where the node area is, you're going to have meristem cells right on either side of the node. And when those cells divide, as they divide, they have to go down those paths of differentiation to form all of those tissues. But the end result is that the internode length gets bigger. So basically, the distance between the two nodes gets longer and the entire stem gets longer. Uh, so this is basically responsible for internode growth, these in intercalary meristems. Uh, and they're just like the other meristem cells. And then we have our secondary growth. And only certain kinds of plants are capable of secondary uh, growth. And the secondary growth comes from lateral meristems. Okay, so uh, the lateral meristems are um, going to be responsible for that. So here, let's say we're looking at a thicker branch or the trunk of the tree. And that takes us over here uh, to this image here. And then we go... Uh, to this image here to see that secondary growth. But before we get there, we're going to go through the progression of going from uh, our primary meristem tissues to a mature stem where the cells are all fully mature. And we still only have our primary plant body. We haven't grown in any thickness. We've just grown and matured to our, our first uh, type of plant body. And then we'll go to the secondary growth to see how the uh, lateral meristems work. We're going to do the same thing for the root. We're going to go to the mature primary plant body after the primary growth is, and development has taken place. And then from there, we'll go to the secondary growth in this image. But just to point out that these uh, lateral meristems have specific names. 
and they're found along the length of, of the uh, stems and the roots. Uh, if we're talking about uh, growth in the size of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the stem, the main way that's going to happen is with the vascular uh, cambium. And so that vascular cambium is it's going to produce more vascular tissue, except now this is secondary vascular tissue. So this is responsible for producing secondary xylem and secondary phloem. And you might have heard of a common name for secondary fly of uh, xylem. That's wood. So the kind of plants that do the secondary growth produce woody tissue. Uh, and they include only uh, uh, things like conifers, like the pine trees. Uh, and... Uh, and uh, um, the uh, not just any angiosperms, but uh, the eudicots. Okay, uh, the eudicots are the ones that have two cotyledons, so something like an oak tree or or uh, or other types of uh, dicot trees, mesquite trees that we that we have around here. So let's go ahead and zoom in and look at how that progression works. So recall that. When we were looking at the early uh, primary meristems that came off of the initial divisions of the apical meristem, you had your procambium. That procambium is going to go through more divisions, and as it divides, the cells are going to become uh, start to differentiate and really mature, and you end up with your primary xylem and phloem. The primary xylem is blue, and the primary uh, phloem is in red. And so here is now your mature primary uh, stem. Uh, there. So uh, from there now. It, uh, special cells between the xylem and the phloem are going to begin to start dividing if we're going to increase in thickness. Uh, those cells are going to become what's called the vascular cambium. So we can imagine if we have cells dividing, those that move inward are going to produce more xylem. Those cells dividing from that region that move outward become phloem. And the end result here is what you see here. You're going to see those typical rings. So I can zoom in a little more. Uh, that we find in, uh, say, a, a, a thick branch or a trunk. Uh, the primary xylem stayed behind, they're in the middle. And the lighter blue color is the newer xylem that's been laid down. So that lighter blue represents the secondary growth or the secondary xylem. And that growth is attributed to that green line right there uh, where the vascular cambium or the meristem cells are. Uh, and then from there, cells that divide from there and move outward become secondary phloem. So where that red area is, the new phloem would be laid just to the inside of it. So the old phloem or the primary phloem would always stay on the outside. The same thing happens in the root, guys. And by the way, you might recognize if you already saw this in the lab that this looks like a eudicot root, uh, just like it should be because only eudicots can go through secondary growth. Uh, so here, when your procambium, uh, which becomes vascular tissue, finally forms the vascular tissue there in the middle, uh, you're, you have your mature primary uh, plant uh, root there. Uh, you have your ground tissue there and your epidermal tissue on the outside. Any further growth is going to occur from the uh, vascular cambium. And just like it was in the stem, the vascular cambium, the cells that are uh, highlighted in green there, cells that move inward become xylem, those that move outward become the phloem. Okay? Uh, there's going to be another kind of meristem, both in the root and the shoot, that's found just outside of the phloem. So if we go from uh, the phloem that's in red and we move outward toward the outer bark there, there's going to be another kind of meristem, a uh, lateral meristem called the cork cambium, which is going to produce the outer layer of the bark. So the outer layer of the bark is called the cork, right? The entire bark, so I was saying the outer layer, but the entire bark starts uh, right at the um, vascular cambium moving outward. So the bark includes uh, the phloem and the cork uh, on the outside, some of the basic structure there. So section two of chapter 36 is on uh, the specific types of plant tissues uh, that we see in plants. Uh, so one of your learning objectives is to be able to name the three different uh, cell types found in ground tissue and what their functions are, uh, and to distinguish between xylem and phloem. Uh, and their structure and function. Uh, so you should be able to recognize them, not only just if you saw them as images structurally, but uh, their structure also gives you an idea of how they function. Uh, what's not mentioned on those objectives is about dermal tissue. You also should be able to understand uh, what dermal tissue is and what are some of the different cell types and their functions, uh, which is what uh, is going to be covered first. So there are three main tissue types. Uh, they all started off as meristem cells that went and differentiated into those uh, primary 
uh, meristem uh, types that formed a protoderm, which is now going to become dermal tissue, the procambium, which we mentioned would become ground tissue, uh, and then the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the I said procambium. I think uh, it should be the ground meristem tissue and then the procambium, which becomes the vascular tissue. Uh, so the dermal tissue is going to cover the external surfaces and it's basically going to protect the body of the plant from uh, the outside elements and from losing things to the outside. Uh, basically helps control what's going on in the, in the plant. Uh, for the ground tissue, you're going to have several types of functions. And so there'll be several types of, uh, of ground tissues. Some are going to be involved in photosynthesis, some in storage, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, some do it for uh, structural support. Some are involved in secretion. Uh, and then the vascular tissue, of course, is going to conduct water and solutes, uh, including nutrients. So uh, looking at dermal tissue first, uh, the dermal tissue is going to form uh, the epidermis and some other related structures. Uh, in many plants uh, and many stru uh, plant structures, it's only going to be one cell layer thick, though there's going to be exceptions to this. Uh, it is the outer uh, boundary or protection for the plant. Uh, and in, uh, uh, for the most part, this uh, epidermal layer is going to produce uh, a water-resistant substance at the surface. Uh, and that water-resistant surface uh, might be a substance called cutin. Uh, and it's sort of like a waxy material. And wax is a uh, kind of a lipid, which is hydrophobic. So since uh, it doesn't mix well with water, it won't let anything dissolve, any water or anything dissolved in water to go through. Uh, and that also has an issue of preventing gas exchange. So oxygen and carbon dioxide wouldn't be able to easily go through uh, either. Uh, there are going to be some special cell types besides your basic epidermal cells that do provide the protective coating. There'll be some specialized cells within that tissue. Uh, and they include the guard cells, which guard the opening called the stoma that allows uh, for uh, gas, gas exchange with the atmosphere. Uh, for example, at the leaves, uh, as the leaves do photosynthesis, produce oxygen, oxygen got to get out because uh, you can't have too much oxygen build up and carbon dioxide has to go back in. Uh, and then we have uh, some special kinds of epidermal cells called trichomes uh, and then the root hairs. Uh, and these would be individual cells found within that, uh, um, uh, uh, within the epidermis. Uh, so looking at the first one, if we were to look, for example, at the bottom surface of uh, a leaf, a given leaf, and you looked at it under magnification, you're going to see these, what your book refers to as sausage-shaped uh, cells. Uh, so right down here in the first image on the bottom, there's actually two cells there. And when those cells um, actively pump solutes in, that's going to have water follow. So as water enters the cell, you're going to have a buildup in pressure, and that causes these cells to bow outward. And as the cells bow outward, uh, they open up uh, the stoma. And the stoma actually translates to mouth. So when you look and you think about it, it looks like a little mouth there. So that allows carbon dioxide to enter in through here and oxygen to leave as well. Uh, and so you can see different examples of those uh, guard cells around the stoma. Uh, in these uh, uh, specimens that have been photographed. Uh, so this is very important because it allows the plant uh, to get rid of its oxygen that it produced by photosynthesis to take in carbon dioxide, but it's also the site of water loss. So water evaporates. Uh, water is brought up from the roots uh, to the shoots, up the stems, and out the, and to the leaves. And once in the leaves, that water exits uh, from the stoma, uh, which is called uh, evapotranspiration since the water is evaporating. Uh, once it's gone through the body of the plant. And then here are trichomes. Uh, and trichomes are going to make uh, the surface of, of uh, something like a leaf, for example, look uh, hairy. So these are hair-like structures. And here on the picture on the right, we have uh, a very detailed uh, scanning electron micrograph, picture taken with a scanning electron microscope at the surface. So here at the surface, you have your basic epidermal cells all along the surface there. But some of these cells differentiate to form these trichomes, these hair-like structures. And some trichomes may even have uh, gland structures at the, at the ends. Uh, and those glands produce uh, substances that are secreted from there. So what are the functions of these trichomes? They vary depending on on the, the trichome and, and the location of the trichome. But one of the things they do is they act like radiators to radiate heat. So they're going to help cool. Uh, 
uh, the surface of the plant. Uh, so the leaves are absorbing a lot of radiant energy, so they warm up quite a bit. They can also protect from ultraviolet light. You know that ultraviolet light is uh, damaging. Uh, it causes sunburns on us, but it can damage uh, DNA and other types of molecules within the plant leaf. Uh, it also can help reduce evaporation if these trichomes are surrounding a stoma, uh, the, the openings of the, on the bottoms of leaves, for example. And then some of them serve as glands uh, and secrete uh, 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 secretion and secrete materials that may actually, in some cases, uh, prevent herbivory, so prevent things like insects uh, or other herbivores from uh, damaging those uh, plant uh, tissues by feeding off of them. Uh, and this is a little side note that we're not going to really talk about, but it, it goes into how uh, a trichome is uh, genetically controlled. We'll skip past that. It's uh, a little side uh, discussion within your textbook. Uh, please read it for enrichment, but we're going to move forward uh, from there. So here uh, are the root hairs. This is a, a little seedling, probably looks like a radish seed that has begun to germinate. The uh, tip of the root down here, that would be where your root cap is and your root apical meristem, uh, where we start to have that division and then the cells are dividing and differentiating. And eventually, we're going to get to a place where the cells have become fully matured. And you're going to know you're there, which we're going to call, uh, when we study the root in more detail, the zone of maturation. And the reason we're going to know this is the zone of maturation is because the cells have become fully mature at this area. And one clue there is that the root hairs have formed on some of the special epidermal cells. So each root hair is actually an extension of an individual cell at the surface here. So one little root cell, uh, epidermal cell, actually grew this little root hair structure. So it's actually an individual epidermal cell, a specialized one. And those really long, thin extensions do something significant. They increase our surface area. And anytime you increase surface area, uh, in biology, that's pretty good for absorbing uh, materials. So these root hairs are going to help the root absorb uh, water and uh, minerals from the soil. Uh, so uh, those are the root hairs. So now we're going to move to ground tissues. And for ground tissues, there's going to be three kinds of ground tissues, uh, three of them. So the first kind is parenchyma, and then we have colenchyma and sclerenchyma. And if we look quickly at the basic functions for colenchyma, just remember, they both are involved in supporting uh, structural support and protection of more delicate uh, tissues within the plant organs. Uh, and then parenchyma is the one uh, ground tissue that has various other functions, including storage. So you might have parenchyma cells that store starch. You might have parenchyma cells that store, uh, or not store, but do photosynthesis, some that involve in secretion. And then they'll give them specific names, like photosynthetic parenchyma would be called uh, chlorenchyma, uh, which is a very specific kind of parenchyma, a subcategory of parenchyma cells. So uh, looking quickly at parenchyma, you can see the first picture down there uh, is of uh, the kind that's photosynthetic. You can tell because you can see the chloroplasts in there. They, these type of cells have characteristically thin cell walls. So they only have a primary cell wall, which was mentioned earlier. The cytoplasm is alive, uh, the entire cell. So the living protoplasm, which includes the cytoplasm and the plasma membrane. Uh, and those cells are alive and actively metabolizing and doing their thing. And uh, their thing may be storage or photosynthesis or secretion. Um, and then the picture on the right has the uh, uh, colenchyma. And remember that earlier, the colenchyma and the sclerenchyma are involved in structural support. So what does this mean? We're going to have thicker cell walls. So you can see this is a cross-section through these cells. And you can see uh, in this specimen uh, that they prepared for the microscope, you can see that these cell walls are, are much thicker and they're stained in red. Uh, so you can see this... Uh, this uh, these parenchyma cells with a thicker cell wall that's going to provide more support. Uh, the thing about the colenchyma is that the protoplast is alive. In other words, the cells are alive and functioning there. This kind of tissue provides much better support, yet it still maintains some flexibility uh, for the plant structures. And then finally, we have sclerenchyma cells, and the sclerenchyma cells are actually dead, uh, usually at maturity. Uh, and they produce a pretty thickened cell wall uh, 
Uh, and these are not the same as the cells that make up the xylem. The xylem is also dead at maturity, but xylem, the cells of xylem are a vascular tissue. We're still talking about ground tissue right now. Uh, so here, your secondary cell walls are going to have a special compound deposited within there. It's going to make the cellulose even more rigid, more stiff, more hard, called lignin. Okay, so uh, you'll have uh, these type of sclerenchyma tissue occurring in two types. You'll have these long, long, uh, uh, twisting uh, groups of strands or fibers of sclerenchyma, and then you'll have sclerids. And the picture on the right is of sclerids. And so I'm going to go ahead and draw in this picture here. This would be where the living cell of the sclerid would have been right here. And then this is the cell wall of the sclerid. You can see it's uh, much thickened. Okay. And those sclerids, the wall of the sclerids, are actually surrounding much thinner cells, which are, uh, you can see that green line on the inside that I'm running along there. That's an actual more delicate cell, probably a parenchyma cell in there. So the sclerid provides some structural support and protection for uh, parenchyma cell in there. So in here would be the body of the cell, of the parenchyma cells, and in here would be the cell body of the sclerenchyma cells. But the cells are dead when this uh, type of uh, of tissue as ground tissue has matured. Uh, so that's an uh, example of the sclerenchyma cells. Uh, so now we're going to move on to vascular tissue. And for vascular tissue, uh, there's two general kinds. There's xylem and phloem. And so we're going to look at xylem first. Uh, and xylem, uh, the, its principal uh, function, uh, the cells that make up xylem, are to conduct water up the plant, from the soil, up the shoots, uh, and to the leaves. Uh, and these cells are dead at maturity, and so what's left behind is the cellulose structure, so let's say the specialized uh, structure of the cell walls and so on. And there's going to be two kinds, uh, and one of the kinds of, of cell types that we would find in the xylem are called tracheids, and all vascular plants that have this vascular tissue have uh, a type of tracheid. So that's why we refer to all vascular plants as uh, tracheophytes. Remember that the root for phyte means plant. So literally translated means these plants have tracheids. Uh, the tracheids are thinner compared to another one, a cell type called a vessel. And the individual uh, tracheid is actually tapered or narrowed on either end. And so I'm going to try to outline one of them. And there's the outline for that one individual cell. And they have a little piece of it of the wall taken out. And then you have the next tracheid right above that one. Now from one tracheid to another, there's a, a, a wall between it, but that wall has pits, and those pits allow the water and any uh, solutes to move through. And this is a very passive uh, sort of situation based on uh, a little bit of physical uh, properties of water and the cellulose. Uh, water adheres to cellulose uh, because cellulose is a polar material and water is polar. And so what you have here is water actually climbing up the walls of uh, these uh, microscopic straw-like structures uh, and water is also uh, cohesive and it uh, attracts other water molecules so as water is climbing up the wall other water molecules are pulling on the lower water molecules and this is going all the way from the soil all the way up the plant all the way out to the leaves so as water molecules are evaporating out of the stoma and the leaves uh, the next water molecule is pulling the water molecules behind it all the way up the plant uh, overall. So it's very passive and it just involves some physical science. Uh, so no energy is ex expended uh, to transport the water. The only energy that was spent was when the cells were alive building these structures. Now in more advanced plants and the most advanced plants, are the angiospermous, the, the ones that produce flowers. So this is, includes both uh, monocots and eudicots. They have special cells in the xylem called vessels, and the vessels are more advanced. Uh, the diameter is much wider. These cells are not tapered, and then they section, did a long section through your skin inside them. These cells are shorter but wider, and if they have a plate across, the plate has uh, holes in it, so that allows the water to move uh, up there. And if we're talking about physics here, the greater diameter allows for a faster flow of the fluid in there. So uh, the tracheids uh, are an advancement for higher plants, the flowering plants. And so uh, if we look at these vessels, so they're, they're called vessels in uh, 
in, the, in these plants. And we look at a uticot that produces uh, secondary uh, growth of, or the wood in the xylem. And so we're looking at above the line I just drew because below the line is a longitudinal section, just like a longitudinal section was made in these diagrams here. So we can see long sections of the cells, but if I look above the line, that's a cross section through the cells. All of this is xylem. The smaller diameter cells are gonna be the tracheids and the larger diameter cells are gonna be uh, the vessels. And I think uh, most of you have already seen this in laboratory when we're looking at these structures in lab. Uh, so, um, so you, you want to uh, remember here that the xylem itself uh, is uh, basically conducting water up and eventually that water ends up at the leaves and some of that water, not all of it, but some of that water is going to end up evaporating out of the, of the uh, stoma and leave the plant entirely. That process of water moving up and evaporating um, uh, up the plant uh, overall, it's called evapotranspiration because at the end it evaporates. So the water uh, transpires and, and moves up the xylem and then evaporates uh, out of the, uh, the xylem. So uh, evapotranspiration would include the evaporation that occurs at the stoma. Uh, and then the other kind of vascular tissue uh, is called phloem. And the main cell type for phloem is uh, called a sieve uh, cell. And a sieve is uh, another way for a sieve is sort of a filter. Uh, and uh, so we have your basic sieve uh, cells. And those are found in uh, some of the lower plants, the seedless uh, uh, vascular plants and in gymnosperms. And then angiosperms, we have a slightly modified one called a sieve tube member, uh, uh, which is a type of flow cell. Uh, but the, essentially, they have some of the same characteristics in that these uh, cells are living when they're functioning. And because they're alive, they're actually expending energy. They have to run a, a sort of uh, or use up energy to help transport fluid. So while water moves up passively in the xylem, if we're going to move uh, water back through the uh, through these um, uh, phloem, through these sieve tubes or these seed cells, the cells actually are going to pump uh, solutes in, in inside themselves. So the cells are going to bring in things like sugars. So uh, the cell, let's say this is a uh, phloem in the, in, the, in the leaf where photosynthesis occurs. What we're going to do is we're going to transport sucrose, uh, which is a sugar product of uh, photosynthesis, inward. And as you bring in a bunch of solutes in there, that's going to have an effect on osmosis. Water likes to follow solute particles. So what that's going to do is going to create increase osmotic pressure. So you're going to have a, a greater flow of water going into the cell because the cell actively pumped the sugar inward. And when you have water moving and following those solutes, that's going to build up water pressure inside. That osmotic pressure is going to build up. And that's going to cause water to be pushed uh, through the cells from areas of higher pressure to lower pressure, and that's what's going to get the water to flow through uh, these sieve cells. Now, they're called sieve cells because uh, each cell is bounded by a cell wall that's going to have these uh, pits in there, and those pits help serve as a sieve. So these are sieve plates. Remember, sieve is like a filter. So what that does is allows water and those small solutes to move through without allowing all of the rest of the cytoplasm to go from one cell to another. So it serves, sort of serves as a filter for just... Uh, water and small particles. Now, the these uh, sieve cells of the phloem actually have a parenchyma type cell. Remember, parenchyma cells are other kinds of cells that are are part of the plant, plant body. And these this parenchyma cell type, so it's not actually part of the phloem. It's called a companion cell. And so this companion cell right here uh, is actually going to help with the business of uh, increasing that uh, pressure in, in the cell there. So that's why they call them companion cells. There. So they assist the function of the, of the cells of the phloem. Uh, so that's your phloem. Uh, and it's uh, a, li a living uh, vascular tissue. So this is section three on roots. Uh, and uh, of course, their main function is for anchoring and absorption. The learning outcomes for you are to describe the key changes that occur in the four regions of a typical root. Uh, these four regions are already listed on this first slide here, uh, and we'll go over those. The second one is to explain the function of root hairs. 
And your third objective is to describe the function of some modified roots that we'll be taking a look at. These are variations on, uh, on the roots. So uh, if we look at uh, how a root develops, it's, it's very, very similar to the way stems develop uh, and uh, uh, overall uh, in terms of the kinds of tissues uh, and the paths of development they take. Uh, so, uh, looking quickly here, this uh, diagram here, it says this is a, um, a picture of uh, a root tip of Zia maize. And that's true, perhaps, of this picture on the left, but Zia maize is a monocot. And if we recall from the lab, it seems that the cross-section that they took here doesn't match what a monocot would look like. You can see that pattern of xylem uh, in the middle of the root there has a sort of star-shaped pattern. That's more typical of a UD cot, but this doesn't take away uh, of how the root develops in general because there's similarities there. So uh, this little slight error doesn't uh, make a difference on the points we're trying to make. The major uh, uh, zones that we see in the root, starting from the bottom at the very tip is the root cap. We're gonna go over that root cap in a little bit. Then we have above that is the zone of cell division, which uh, it's named after what's going on there. Uh, cells are dividing, and then the elongation zone, where the cells elongate. And then finally, we have uh, the point where uh, the cells are going to be differentiating into their mature form and have their, uh, their ultimate functions within the root. Uh, so looking at the root cap, uh, so for the root cap, uh, there's going to be two cell types there. And these cell types are constantly being uh, made by the apical, the apical meristem on the root. So that root apical meristem uh, is there. And the two cell types are the, the columella cells and the root uh, cap cells. The columella cells are, are involved in uh, uh, perceiving gravity. So they respond to gravity and they help direct uh, the growth of the root straight down into the soil. So those... Uh, uh, respond to, uh, to gravity and in, in directing the, the growth and development of the root. Uh, and then the root cap cells, those function in protection of the delicate uh, meristem tissue uh, of the root apical meristem. So uh, those two uh, cell types within the root cap, very important for protection and uh, the ability to direct the growth of the root down, downward. So uh, going into the zone of cell division, uh, here within your root. So if we, we look at the bottom picture here, you're, you're going to have your meristem uh, right down there in the in the tip area there. And uh, those are the ultimate uh, meristem cells and can differentiate into anything. So as they divide, remember from the earlier section, um, the uh, root uh, or the other process going on in there, the root's going to be growing downward. So this apical meristem is constantly following uh, along with that tip, and the cells that remain in that tip uh, uh, at the apical meristem are going to stay as meristem cells, but the second cell of the division, uh, every cell divides, one stays as a meristem, the other one uh, starts to go down those paths of differentiation. Uh, so uh, those daughter cells that are going to arise go on to form uh, those um, uh, three primary meristem type cells that we talked about in an earlier section. They include the protoderm, uh, the procambium, and the ground meristem uh, tissue. And so we looked at that earlier when we were examining this picture over here. Uh, that green, uh, the green cells there in the middle would be the procambium, which will eventually become vascular tissue, uh, for example. So uh, you may want to go back and review that from the uh, prior section in the chapter. Uh, so uh, there are a couple of uh, little side discussions on uh, how uh, development in the root is genetically uh, directed or determined genetically uh, with uh, uh, some uh, of the metabolic features that are controlled by certain genes. We're not going to spend time on that. I, I encourage you to read over that. It's interesting. Uh, but. Uh, uh, the paths of development these cells take, uh, in short, uh, are, are genetically determined. And so uh, this first one here is on whether or not uh, epidermal cell will form a root hair or not. Uh, this next one would be on whether or not um, a ground meristem cell would become an endoderm cell or a ground cell. Uh, 
and they study these basically by looking at mutations in genes, and these genes are, uh, of course, uh, are instructions for making certain proteins that are involved in the control of, of the development of these cells. But that's all I'm going to say, and we're going to move on. Uh, so the next, um, uh, I think I, I, let's go back real quick here. Uh, in this zone of cell division here, uh, the the cells that come off uh, are going to be small and cuboidal uh, in shape, have a large nucleus, and they're going to continue to divide. And the cells I'm talking about are the ones that are staying behind uh, where the meristem was uh, um, dividing. And they're kind of shaded in green right here. Those cells are going to still be dividing. And as they divide, those cells that are going to become protoderm will eventually uh, at some point mature and become uh, epidermis and then the procambium. As those cells are dividing and dividing, they're beginning to differentiate and will form vascular tissue and then the ground tissue the same, but it would be formed from the ground meristem. Uh, so that's why they call it the zone of cell division because the cells are still dividing. They're not fully differentiated yet. Uh, and then once we get past that zone of cell division, uh, which was right here, uh, we now get into the zone of elongation. The cells are no longer going to be dividing, but instead they're going to be growing in size. Uh, and they're going to grow in length more than they are wide. Uh, the width may increase slightly, but uh, overall the cells are elongating. And this is helping to further push uh, the very tip of the root further into the soil. Now the cells at this point uh, are not fully differentiated yet, so they're not uh, the fully functioning mature cells. Uh, that's going to be for the next uh, uh, area, and that would be the zone of maturation. So once that growth uh, of the size of the individual cells has finished, then the cells begin to differentiate. And you can always tell that, as was mentioned earlier, when you get to these root hairs. Those root hairs are specialized uh, epidermal cells. And at that point, you know, the cell that produced uh, that extension or the root hair, uh, the root hair cell, you know, it's, it's, it's in a mature form already and it's fully differentiated. And the same is true for any cells going all the way across. Your vascular tissue cells are fully formed. Your ground tissue cells are fully formed once you get to the zone of maturation. And that brings us to the slide here where they have cross sections of... Uh, uh, the two types of roots we've uh, likely studied in the lab already. Uh, and this is the monocot root, and this is the unicot root. And we can tell because uh, the monocot root within the vascular cylinder uh, or the stelly in there has these uh, a ring uh, pattern of xylem and phloem there uh, that you see in the middle there. And when it comes to the unicot, uh, the unicot, as I mentioned earlier, sort of has this kind of a star-shaped pattern uh, in there of xylem, uh, which is one of the kinds of vascular tissue. Either way, both are going to be bounded uh, from the ground tissue, which we would call the cortex over here. They're going to be bounded by this, uh, what looks like red in these uh, specimen preparations due to some staining that they use. That uh, red strip that we see all right here. Uh, that's the endodermis. Uh, so um, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, what that endodermis is. So uh, you want to make sure you can recognize the difference between a monocot and a eudicot root. The layout is pretty much the same. Your vascular tissue is going to be towards the inside of the root, but the pattern of that vascular tissue differs. Uh, remember that the epidermis is going to be on the outside. Um, um, and in this picture here, you can actually see some of the root hairs were captured in that cross section. But what we're going to do is we're going to come focus here on the uticot uh, root. And so from here, we're going to take out and zoom in uh, to that vascular cylinder. And there you can see that red uh, uh, strip of cells going all the way around, which is the boundary between those ground cells that are actually storing starch. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut out this area right there in that box I drew, and that is going to represent what's being drawn right here. Okay, and so uh, what you see here is on the outside these uh, beige-colored cells that are right here. Uh, that those are part of the cortex uh, cells. Those will be storing starch, and then this purple cells that are colored there. Those represent that endodermis 
endo for inside. And this endodermis, those cells secrete this special uh, material that waterproofs. The material may be a substance like subarin. And subarin is uh, it's a, uh, a nonpolar material, it's hydrophobic. And so you can see it, it's secreted between the cells uh, and it kind of reminds me of bricks in a wall. When they make a brick wall, they put that mortar in between so that uh, subarin uh, there in the middle, that waterproofing substance is uh, kind of like the mortar between the bricks. But the purple faces of the cells don't have that material. Okay, so um, this, uh, that more that subarin that's between the cells is going to be referred to as the Casparian strip. Okay, and that Casparian strip is uh, along with the cells there form this boundary, which sort of helps regulate what gets into the vascular tissue on the inside. Uh, and so when we look at that, I'm going to zoom in so we can see it a little more clearly. You can see that uh, I think when I was uh, modifying this slide, I accidentally cut off uh, the first part of the word there. It's not Perian strip, uh, it's Casparian strip. Uh, and the Casparian strip is that uh, subarin uh, that's uh, between those endodermal cells, which are colored purple. But you can see if water coming from the outside of the root, which is out over here, comes, enters into the root and comes in, when it hits that Casparian strip, it can't go through. Okay, so it, uh, what this does is it stops water from just sneaking right through the cells. And instead, the water and anything that's dissolved in it, any minerals from the soil uh, that the plant might need, are going to be allowed to go through the cell itself before it gets into the vascular tissue and then goes up the roots up to the shoots above ground. So in a sense, the endodermis helps regulate what can get into uh, the cell because the endodermal cells are there. Uh, allowing certain things to go through. The other thing uh, that we point, besides the fact that we have xylem and phloem, they're on the inside, is that we have a, a, a strip of cells right to the inside of the endodermis, and that strip of cells is called the pericycle. And uh, as your lab manual had indicated uh, earlier, that pericycle uh, is responsible for growing those lateral roots. So new roots grow actually from the inside of, uh, of, the, uh, of the cell. So this pericycle kind of serves as a meristem on its own. And so you would end up having a root that would be growing uh, just the way any root would grow from the inside and then eventually emerging outward. And the same thing right out of here, you would have a root apical meristem continuing to grow the length of uh, that lateral root. From the outside of the root, it looks like the root is growing immediately from the outside, but it's not. It's grown from the inside, uh, from that pericycle. Uh, so uh, one of the study questions I've written for you, besides some of the basic information we've covered, uh, the questions ask you to consider those uh, uh, items. This flow chart, I recommend that you draw and, and uh, sort of understand because it basically shows quite a bit of the similarities in the way both the roots, root structures and shoot structures uh, develop. So I really recommend that you go through that. Remember that in the life cycle of any plant, including the vascular plants that we're covering right now, uh, a sperm would fertilize an egg. And the details of that depends on, on uh, the life histories of those plant groups that we've been covering prior to this. Uh, but when the sperm does fertilize the egg, you're going to get your diploid zygote, and then that zygote uh, develops into an embryo. And if these are angiosperms, uh, like this uticot uh, we see here, then you have your fully developed embryo uh, within the seed. Uh, and there you can see the cotyledons, so we know, and there's two of them, so we know this is a uticot. Uh, and they're storing the, uh, the food supply for the embryo. And then right here, right at the tip where it's, uh, it's pointing, it says apical meristem, that's your shoot apical meristem, which is going to help grow the above ground parts. And then down here in the radical, down in this area right here, that's where you're going to have your, um, your root apical meristem. So coming to the diagram here, your embryo is going to have that shoot apical meristem, which is right here. Then your root apical meristem, which is going to be right here. Now, as this uh, seed germinates and uh, the embryo begins to grow into a seedling and then into a, uh, the primary structures of a more mature plant, we can track uh, 
the direction of the development of cells that arise from these meristems. And uh, what would be good or handy to do is note some of the similarities and differences. If you note the similarities, then recognizing the differences is just that little bit extra work you'd have to do. Uh, so I want to point out here that we're always going to continue to have these apical meristems at the end of any stem. And at the end of any root, we're going to have those apical meristems. You're going to have the collection of cells that can divide and differentiate to any other cell. Uh, so if we follow in both parts of this diagram and we go straight down in this direction here, we're going to note that the apical meristem is totally related to what we would call primary growth. And that primary growth is just the elongation, continuing to grow the length of uh, the stems and the length of the roots uh, on both paths, right? Now, keep in mind that uh, along this path here, when those uh, apical meristem cells are dividing, as we go along this path here, I'm going to draw a little box and make a little note down here what that box means here along that arrow. What's happening is those apical meristem cells, remember uh, when each meristem cell divides, one stays as a, a fully meristematic cell and the other one starts to go th towards differentiation. So when it starts to go th towards differentiation, it's going to become one of three types that we covered, covered earlier. So those three types of primary uh, meristem. They're still meristem, but they're more like mer uh, sub-meristem in that they're not fully uh, able to differentiate anything. And those three subtypes include the one that's uh, going to become the epidermis, which we call protoderm. Uh, and the cell's not fully developed, but the cells there are going to already down that path that they're going to become those epidermal type of cells. So they're going to become general epidermal cells or root hair cells, uh, uh, for example, if we're in the root. And uh, then we have uh, uh, the, the procambium, um, primary meristem, and then the ground meristem which would become uh, ground tissue. So that's what that box means, is that as, as growth and development is, is occurring and we're elongating our shoot, at the tip of the shoot, you're going to continue to have the apical meristem, but along that path of development, you have uh, cells that are going down these paths to become epidermis, vascular tissue, and, and ground meristem. So any particular part of the plant, whether it's the roots or we go to the shoots above, uh, leaves, they're going to have those uh, uh, paths being taken by cells that are coming off the meristem. So this is also true uh, when we see it right here uh, for the shoot apical meristem and the root apical meristem. Now, uh, other parts along this, uh, the shoot stem uh, or the shoots above ground are going to go down paths that are going to become leaves. So you have your leaf primordia and then you have your bud primordia, which are uh, the leaf primordia become leaves which you're going to have all three major tissue types, ground tissue, vascular tissue, and so on. And then you're also going to have these lateral uh, type shoots, which are branches. Uh, and the bud primordia may also become flowers. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and draw that red box around there because these primordia are going to have those three types of primary meristem as well. Okay. And uh, likewise, when it comes down to the root apical meristem, we have our pericycle. And the pericycle, as those cells divide, uh, they're, they're not going to be fully uh, uh, differentiated yet, but they're going to start to contain uh, those three types of primary uh, meristem uh, cell types. Um, uh, the protoderm, uh, procambium, and ground meristem. Remember, it's the pericycle that's going to produce those lateral roots, right? Uh, and then if we're going to have secondary growth, which is the... the um, the paths that are going this way in both cases. Here we're going to see completely the same thing. Okay, We're going to have uh, lateral meristems called vascular cambium and cork cambium and that's the same for both the shoots above and those roots going down underground. This cambium is basically meristem that's very very specific. The vascular cambium um, is going to be producing uh, xylem and phloem only, uh, which are very specific cell types uh, there. So the xylem in the secondary growth is going to be growth in the width, would become wood. Uh, 
So even uh, as a root underground becomes uh, thicker and thicker to support a larger plant above, like in the case of a tree, you start to form wood within the roots. Um, the phloem will go on to become, uh, or the phloem is a vascular tissue, and it's going to go on to become part of the bark, which is the inner bark. Uh, and then you have another layer of cells toward the outside called the cork cambium. And that cork cambium is going to produce that outer bark, which includes uh, the type of tissue we refer to as cork. So the bark, essentially, uh, is going to include uh, both the phloem, uh, and uh, outer bark uh, to the outside. And the same is going to be true. We see the same pattern here for the shoots above, uh, the same for the roots. So uh, we see our xylem and phloem being produced. The xylem becomes the wood uh, in the stems above ground. Uh, the phloem becomes part of the inner bark and the cork cambium produces the outer bark. Uh, so one of the things I recommend you guys do is sketch this, be able to try to recreate it from memory and then actually understand uh, what's going on based on what we've been talking about. Understand the roles of those meristems as they move on to develop these uh, mature structures uh, in the mature plant. Uh, the mature xylem, phloem, leaves, uh, roots, the bark, and so on. All those are mature uh, structures in these plants. Uh, and also remember that uh, the top of both paths here, uh, this one right here, and this one up here, that's basically only secondary growth. So this is going to be seen only in uh, things like UD cots or uh, uh, something like a pine tree. Monocots don't have the secondary growth. Uh, so looking at the entire root itself, uh, we know that roots are going to help anchor uh, and provide uh, uh, absorption of water and materials from the soil. Uh, and tap roots are very good at that. And, and a tap root is going to be... Uh, um, uh, typical of a UD cot. So uh, in this diagram, I've given you a carrot that we find at the store as an example of a top root. But something like a mesquite tree would have a really uh, long top root to get all the way down there to get to where there's water underground. Uh, so this is typical of a UD cot uh, flowering plant. And then we have fibrous root systems. Uh, and that's uh, what we see right here. Uh, that looks like a corn plant, and fibrous root systems are typical of monocots. And there, there's no main single large root. There just seems to be a whole bunch of uh, network of uh, uh, roots that there's no distinctive major uh, single large root in there. Uh, and then along with roots, we're going to have some modifications on roots. Uh, and the picture on the right shows what we would refer to as adventitious roots. And what defines adventitious roots is that these roots arise from a place other than where there's a root. Okay, so if we look at the picture up here, this looks like a vine that may be uh, sprawling along the ground uh, there. And so basically, this is a stem uh, right there. And along the stem, you have these little root structures growing from there. So since these little roots are growing from a stem, that fits the definition of what an adventitious root is. Uh, so... That's a modification or a, a, another kind of root. And then some other modifications on roots include these prop roots uh, that you see in the picture on the left. And the prop roots are going to help keep the plant upright. So they're going to help steady the plant, keep it from falling over, basically prop it up. And then you have aerial roots. And those aerial roots obtain water and other materials from the air, uh, including nitrogen. And so you can see here that the plant that's growing on the trunk of the, of the larger tree you can see the roots are kind of sprawling along the trunk. And all those roots are doing is just helping to cling the plant to the, the tree. And those roots are not uh, are just taking everything they need from the air. So those would be aerial roots. And then we have pneumatophores. And uh, we've seen that, uh, maybe I've seen that term before, uh, pneumatic, uh, pneumos or pneumatic is refer reference to air. Uh, and you may hear that the, the disease of the lungs called uh, pneumonia. Pneumos means air. And fours is a root that comes from, uh, for the, the root of, uh, of fours or fores means to carry. So these literally are uh, modified roots that carry air. And in this case, they're taking air uh, to deeper roots underground where the oxygen level is poor. For example, in a swamp area, like you see in the picture on the left there, you have some trees that are growing, 
and they're growing in saturated soil, saturated with water, so it's difficult to get oxygen. There's not a lot of oxygen down there, so these pneumatophores that you see growing up above the water line actually provide little tunnels for air to go down deeper uh, underwater to give oxygen there. And then not pictured here, we have contractile roots, uh, but these types of contractile roots would uh, pull uh, plants deeper into the soil. Uh, and then also not pictured are parasitic roots. Uh, and those roots actually would uh, penetrate into the tissues of other plants and steal things from them. Uh, there's a plant called the mistletoe. You might have heard that as, uh, uh, before. That mistletoe is an example of a parasitic plant. Uh, and in our area, we see it growing often, or I do anyway, on mesquite trees usually and some other kinds of trees. It looks like a ball. Uh, it looks like an out-of-place ball of leaves. Uh, they're in the middle of some of the branches uh, up in the tree, and that's your mistletoe. Uh, and then we have food uh, and and water storage type roots. And the the plant we, uh, or the root we see down there that looks like they cracked it open with a shovel here, uh, I believe is a water storage root. So there's a lot of water stored within that tissue there, uh, and uh, the weight of that structure can be pretty heavy. 50 kilograms is over 100 pounds. And then we have buttress roots. Uh, and uh, those provide uh, extra stability, especially in areas like rainforests where the soil is not very deep. And buttress is an architectural term. Uh, so let's say I'm building a wall and that wall is supporting some other uh, types of structures here. And uh, this wall has a potential to slip outward. And in order to prevent that, we would build what they call in architecture a buttress. So that's kind of what we see right here. We see this modified root here that is serving like, or uh, roots here that are serving like buttresses. So this is uh, section six, and this one is covering uh, specifically the stems, which uh, uh, the main concept here is uh, they provide support for above ground organs um, that include the leaves uh, involved in photosynthesis. Uh, and uh, that's a, a major function for them. Uh, so your outcomes, learning outcomes for this section include to identify the contributions of an axillary bud to plant form. Axillary buds would be where, for example, branches might grow from uh, on a stem. Uh, and your second objective is to differentiate between cross sections of monocot and eudicot. This is something I think we've already practiced at this point in the laboratory. Uh, and so we'll just quickly review that. And then also to discover uh, three functions of modified stems. Uh, so there are some modified stems we're going to be looking at. Um, so when we were looking at roots, when we look at stems, there's a, a good comparison there, which has already been mentioned briefly in prior sections. Uh, we're going to have the same kinds of tissues. You're going to have uh, a dermal tissue, ground tissue, and, and vascular tissue in there. Uh, these above ground stems arise from the apical meristems. Uh, of the shoot, they're above ground. And in some cases, when you have secondary growth of the stem, the lateral meristems are, are important as well. Uh, the shoot apical meristem uh, is gonna initiate uh, uh, the kind of primary growth that we've talked about already with roots. And the image you see here on the right is a three-dimensional image of very high resolution produced by a scanning electron uh, microscope and uh, the apical meristem cells would be in here. We actually have seen uh, a picture of, of this or images of this when we looked through cross-section of the genus Coleus. Uh, and for that, it was actually a real flat two-dimensional image of a specimen as we cut a long section through uh, this. And then you can see the immature leaves there, the leaf primordia they're called. Uh, and then at the very tip is where the apical meristem is. And uh, there's some young leaf primordia there uh, overall, and this was uh, pretty much how the specimen looked like. Uh, and at every point that these uh, in these uh, rudimentary leaves, they're not fully functioning leaves yet, those would be at nodes. And at every space between there, you would have little axillary buds starting to form. And those axillary buds themselves have uh, sort of this uh, meristematic uh, tissue or tissue that divides and differentiates like any meristem would. Um, starting off with uh, things we've also considered uh, by way of laboratory would be the arrangement of leaves. So you want to make sure you uh, review that. Uh, remember, every place where a leaf is attached is called a node. And when you only have one leaf 
uh, at every node, that arrangement is going to be called alternate arrangement. Uh, if you have two leaves at every node, then that's going to be referred to as opposite uh, uh, leaf arrangement. And if you have three or more leaves at a given node, then that's whorled. Uh, and there's a fancy name for this arrangement uh, that of the growth of leaves on a stem, and uh, that was referred to as phylo, which references the leaf. This root means leaf, uh, and taxis. So phylo taxis is a leaf arrangement. Uh, then I uh, want you guys to also uh, review the external structure of a stem, uh, and they include terms we've already seen before, like a node. And one of the things that I ask you guys to do in that review guide or that study guide is uh, to um, uh, sketch this, this, this image and then uh, see if you can re recreate a basic sketch of this. So you would draw it, label it, and then uh, try to do it again from memory. That way you can visualize these structures. But that's not always uh, enough because when it comes to uh, these uh, tests that you're given, a lot of times the questions aren't going to have a picture. So you would need to be able to see, well, how does this image correspond to a written word? What words might be used to describe the structure? For example, a node. Well, the node, we can see that uh, when we're pointing to a node, a node is a place where uh, you have a leaf uh, that's attached. So there would be a node right there. This would be a node right there. So the words would say point where a leaf is attached would be a description of that. So you might want to write yourself a brief description in your own words on what each of these structures along the external uh, stem would be. Uh, so make sure you review the, the point of a node that's based between leaves or the internode where leaves are attached. Uh, the blade is the flat portion of the leaf. So here from here to here would be a blade. And the petiole is the stalk that attaches the leaf. You can see it labeled right there. Uh, and the axle is the angle at which the leaf attaches to the stem. So uh, this would be, for example, right there would be the axillary region. And it's in that area there where you have this axillary bud. So you can see an axillary bud right there where I'm pointing. That there would be an axillary bud. And that axillary bud would actually have meristem cells that would grow into, could grow into a branch or grow into a flower. Uh, for example. And then at the end, you're going to have this terminal bud, which is usually going to be covered by scales. These scales are hardened uh, tissues that help protect the uh, the apical meristem at the end. Remember, the apical meristem is the one that is involved in uh, primary growth. Now, the difference between the one on the left and the right is we have a summer stem or summer twig. And then in winter, there's many species of trees, for example, that would lose their leaves uh, uh, as a part of their biology, and uh, those would be called deciduous trees. Um, another thing you're supposed to do is be able to distinguish some of the basic structure, structural differences between stems that would be a uticot stem and a stem that would be a monocot stem. Uh, and these are things, again, we've already practiced with in the lab. One of the things you notice about a uticot stem is that the vascular tissue, and I'm going to circle where vascular tissue is located. You can see it identified as xylem and phloem uh, right here uh, in the image. Those vascular bundles of tissue tend to be uh, going into this circular pattern. When you think back to the roots, this is not the same as in the root. Uh, in the root, the circular pattern of vascular tissue is found in monocots. So if you remember that, there's the, that uh, that difference there. Uh, so um, here, then you're going to have ground tissue in the middle uh, that uh, may be doing something like storing tissue there. And that ground tissue that's in the middle is going to be called the pith. And then the ground tissue that you're going to see where the vascular tissue is toward the outside, uh, that's going to generally be called the cortex. And uh, generally speaking, uh, the cortex, the cortical region of any organ, even animal organs, is the outer part of the organ. So if we say a stem is an organ, then the outer portion is the cortex. Uh, a, a big difference here uh, is that uh, uh, for the monocot, instead of having this uh, uh, arrangement, a circular pattern, the vascular tissue is actually just scattered throughout. So there you're going to have bundles of vascular tissue that have both xylem and phloem throughout. Uh, there and then uh, those uh, bundles are filled in with uh, ground tissue. So you can see the ground tissue there between the bundles uh, overall. And so that's basically what's being mentioned here about the difference in patterns. You should be able to recognize that. Uh, 
uh, and the term pith and cortex are mentioned there for the uticot. Moving on now to um, what happens uh, for secondary growth. Now, secondary growth uh, is uh, not something you see in, in uh, every plant group. Secondary growth is going to be growth in the diameter of roots and shoots or the stems above ground. Uh, and in order to do that, you're going to have to have a structure called vascular cambium. So this is only going to be seen in things like, uh, for example, gymnosperms, uh, which include pine trees or conifers. And, and what I'm talking about is that lateral or secondary growth. So gymnosperms and in uh, not, any, not just any angiosperm, those are the ones that make fruit, but the eudicots. The eudicots, not monocots, don't have this, right? So... Uh, the secondary growth is going to uh, be grown from a, a meristematic tissue whose uh, job is very specific. This meristem is a, a narrow one. It's more like uh, 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 the procambium type of tissue uh, in which the cells are programmed to either turn into phloem or xylem uh, there. And so uh, what's going to happen here and what's explained over here and again, monocots, they don't do this. There's no vascular cambium, so they have no secondary growth. Uh, so for if we're talking about a typical eudicot, here we have a eudicot stem here on the top image there. And there you have, this is your primary structure. This is what happens once the stem has matured after its primary growth. You're going to have little bundles of xylem and phloem. And the xylem is always on the inside. And there's the pith in the middle that we saw in the prior image. And there's going to be this uh, these cells that are located right between the two tissues. It is right there that the vascular cambium is going to develop. Okay, so cells within there are going to start to divide. And as they divide, cells that move inward turn into xylem, and cells that move out, outward turn into phloem. And this xylem and phloem is now secondary uh, tissue. Uh, so we're going to call it secondary xylem and secondary phloem. So you can see now that we move to the image of the bottom as this process is taking place. Your vascular cambium, which is going to be between the two uh, vascular tissues, xylem and phloem, is uh, the green uh, layer that's drawn there in cross section. Uh, and the cells, as they divide, the ones that move inward are going to produce this secondary uh, xylem, which is a lighter color blue. The primary xylem was that is that darker blue one that we saw in the earlier picture. Uh, the cells that move outward are going to become secondary phloem, and they're indicated by the lighter pink color. Uh, uh, vascular tissue there, the primary uh, phloem gets pushed uh, further outward. So the secondary uh, xylem and phloem are going to border that vascular cambium. And as this growth continues, the diameter of your stem is going to continue to get bigger and bigger uh, here. So that's how uh, the secondary growth occurs. And this growth is, occurs because of uh, the formation of, of a vascular cambium, which is a lateral meristem. It's called secondary growth. And if we continue this process, then we're going to get the familiar growth rings that we see in uh, uh, trees. Trees are a woody species. They produce wood. And the wood itself uh, is the xylem. So here, if we continue this pattern of growth, there is still your primary uh, xylem from the primary growth, uh, which was just growing in length early on in the young stem. Uh, but then as we start to progress year by year, we're going to start laying down layers of secondary xylem. And based on those layers... You can tell that this stem is a uh, one, two, three, four-year-old stem. Here's going to be where your vascular cambium is, and all of this light pink area would be the secondary phloem that's been created. The primary phloem is in the dark, in the darker red. That was created along with the primary xylem during the primary growth, which was just the first growth as the stem was growing in length. There's going to be another uh, meristem tissue that's for, found further out that's going to be responsible for producing uh, uh, the outer bark. And that outer uh, meristem tissue is going to be right along here, just outside of the of the phloem. And this one is going to be called cork uh, cambium. And that cork cambium is going to divide just like the vascular cambium is. And, the, and that cork cambium, the cells that move inward, are going to become a, a parenchyme type tissue, which is a ground tissue. And those that move outward are going to create uh, the structure that we call cork. This is the same material they use to cork up uh, like wine bottles and stuff. 
And so that's gonna that comes out in this image here. So here you have an older stem. Uh, this one even looks like a trunk here. And you have your xylem, which is your wood. So that's in the red and the orange. All of those are your rings of xylem. And then just outside of that, there's your vascular cambium. In the prior picture, this was colored dark green. Now they've colored it white. Then if you move outward from there, that's where your phloem is. It's not colored red like it was in the prior picture, but there's your phloem. And then once you get outside of the phloem, there's your cork cambium. Okay? And then the cork cambium is responsible for producing this outer bark, which protects uh, the stem itself. So in the, in the next image here, uh, and again, we were talking about the cork cambium, right, and how it produces the cork. Uh, and then uh, to the inside produces the parenchyma cells, which actually has a name, uh, philoderm. In the next slide, what we're going to do is we're going to look at an image of a real specimen that's been uh, cut, uh, cut out and put onto a slide so we can see it under magnification. And what we're going to be looking at, I'm going to draw on this picture here above, is a little section taken off right here where I'm writing the box. So there at the upper edge there uh, is what we're going to be seeing in the next picture there. So in this picture here, you know, I'm going to draw on there. This would be the outer edge of the bark, the outermost part. And this area out here would be outside the stem. So if we move this way in the picture, we're moving inward towards the center of the stem, of a bigger stem. And eventually we're going to go into the phloem and then cross the vascular cambium and get into the xylem where the wood is. But here we're on the very outside part, okay? And on the very outside part is where we have our cork cambium. So these are our cork cambium cells right here. And these cells, as they divide, the cells that move outward become cork. And those cork cells are going to end up dying, but not before they've secreted a substance called suberin. And suberin is kind of like cutin, and, and suberin is basically watertight a material. It, it's um, um, uh, nonpolar, so it doesn't like water. And so that means water can't get through this area here. Uh, now, if water can't get in, water can't get out. And also oxygen can't get, get, get in either. And it and the cork cambium and philoderm cells, they're alive. So these living cells are actually going to need oxygen. Uh, so what happens? Like we've blocked off uh, any movement of water and oxygen for that matter. Uh, but I'll tell you how that, uh, what a structural feature is to allow uh, these cells that are further deeper in to breathe, right? In other words, to exchange gas with the atmosphere. Uh, so the, again, from the cork cambium, the cells that move outward are called the cork cells. Uh, and they're more box-like shaped, and they're they're dead and waterproofed. The cells that move inward and become uh, part of a structure called the philoderm, which is a parenchyma tissue, so part of the parenchyma. Uh, also, all of this is uh, considered parenchyma and living tissue. Uh, and uh, this whole outer portion is going to be called the periderm, which includes the cork, the cork cambium, and the philoderm. And this periderm actually replaces the epidermis which was present in the primary plant body before this plant started growing wider. So if you look at a young stem in cross section, as it begins to grow wider and wider, that epidermis is going to split open and there goes the protection that that epidermis does. So this epidermis then is going to be replaced by periderm during secondary growth. And that periderm does all the things that the epidermis would do, except the periderm has multiple layers of cells doing the protection. Uh, so how does then, uh, if the outer bark is uh, watertight, and if it's watertight, we can't let oxygen in and carbon dioxide out, how does uh, these woody plants deal with that? Well, it turns out they have special structural features within that uh, outer bark called a lenticel. And these lenticels are very obvious here uh, in this uh, particular uh, 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 tree species. They're not always that obvious, but this is really nice to demonstrate the point. If I were to take a cross section through this stem, right through a lenticel, just like that, and then lay that down on a slide, a very thin cross section, to look at it, this would be the outside of the stem. And as we move inward there, we're going to come across what, what is the cork, cork cambium. And as we move further in, uh, we're going to run into the, the phloem uh, here. And then as we move in, we get to our vascular tissue moving further in. Uh, and then there's the pith on the inside, right? So out here is your outer bark the periderm and again it's waterproof because of the cork cells on the outside but you're going to have little areas and this is the area right here where you're going to have unsuberized which means it doesn't have the suberin 
or that watertight uh, compound that's uh, secreted in that area to make it waterproof. And in those areas where you don't have the superized cork cells, uh, now oxygen can get in and uh, carbon dioxide can get out because those are living cells and they're respiring and respiring cells require oxygen to uh, make ATP in their mitochondria and they generate carbon dioxide in the process and that needs to get out. So these are kind of like little breathing holes. And if I had to compare them to every anything, they uh, basically have a similar function to stoma, uh, the stomata that we see on the bottom of the leaves to allow for that gas exchange in the, uh, with the atmosphere. So those are called lenticels. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at modified uh, stems, uh, modifications on stems, just like we had modifications on leaves. And so there's a modified stem uh, type that's called a bulb, and you've probably seen this if you looked at an onion. Uh, so here is a, a bulb that we see on the first picture there on the bottom. And this modified swollen stem is underground. Uh, and it may, it's made up of fleshy leaf-like structures. So just like when you cut through an onion, you see all those layers, those are fleshy leaf-like structures uh, overall. And then there's another structure called a quorum, which is not uh, the same as a bulb. And it's not, there's not one pictured here, but it looks very similar superficially to a, to a bulb. The difference is that the quorum does not have those fleshy leaf-like structures. So it's more of a, a solid stem-like uh, structure. Then another kind of modified stem is called a rhizome, and rhizomes are horizontal and underground. Uh, so here we have an example, they pulled this plant out of the ground, and the ground level would have been right here, so the rhizome would be moving underground, and it's a stem, it's not a root, right? Uh, so that's the reason why those roots that are coming off of the stem are called adventitious roots, because when we talked about that earlier with roots, the modified uh, uh, types of roots here. These would be roots that just uh, adventitiously come off of other structures other than a, a root itself. Uh, so those would be adventitious roots. So this kind of looks like uh, some kind of a, maybe a grass species, I don't know. But you can see at every node, you have leaves, uh, photosynthetic leaves coming from there. So remember, a rhizome is an underground stem. And then if we have above ground horizontal stems, those are generally called runners and stolons, right? And so here, the ground would be under, and the stem would run along the surface of the ground, and at every note, you'd have your leaves popping up. And then again, you'd have uh, uh, adventitious roots growing from there. Now, stolons are similar, uh, except at uh, the end of these, uh, if the stolons that are, um, are available swell up and store a whole lot of stuff, we're gonna call those tubers, which again, a tuber and, and uh, stolons are basically modifications of these stems. And you're familiar with tubers because tubers are used to make the French fries at Whataburger. Those are tubers, are, potatoes are examples of tubers. They're stems. And just like any other stem, they have nodes. If you've ever left a potato long enough uh, uh, anywhere, then you're just exposed to light, eventually you're going to start to see little leaves starting to grow uh, at the surface at the nodes on the stem. In fact, uh, you can cut a piece of that potato out, put it in the ground, and it'll start growing a whole other potato plant. Pretty cool. Um, so there's tubers mentioned uh, here. Uh, another modified stem is called a tendril, and tendrils are modified stems that grow from uh, plants that are vine-like, and these vines like to climb uh, structures, so they can use it to climb walls or climb other plants. And what the tendrils do are these modified stems are going to wrap around structures to help support that upward growth of these vines. So tendrils are used for climbing. Uh, and then we have another modified stem called a cladophyll. Uh, and this is a stem that's going to behave like a photosynthetic leaf, but it's not a leaf, it's a stem. And that's uh, what we see in our cactuses that we have around here, the prickly pear cactus or nopal. Uh, uh, these flattened pads are actually stems, they're not leaves. The leaves themselves are actually reduced and modified into little spiny-like structures. Uh, so what you would call in a uh, uh, thorns on a cactus, technically those are reduced leaves, and those reduced leaves are in botany are called spines. So the cactus would be covered with these spines. And the spines are to protect the fleshy uh, stem-like structures. So the stem itself would have photosynthetic cells that do the photosynthesis for the cactus. Those are called cladophylls. So this is um, uh, section five of chapter 36, and this one is specifically covering leaves.
And the learning objectives uh, for this include uh, relating leaves uh, to its role in photosynthesis and to explain how leaf structure affects gas exchange and water loss. Uh, leaves are going to be structures that are uh, initiated or grown uh, first as primordia, or the leaf primordia, which we saw in the earlier section. These uh, leaves are responsible for uh, photosynthesis, although photosynthesis can take place in in other uh, parts of the plant if uh, if the photosynthetic cells are, for example, uh, uh, the photosynthetic cells are located on the stem. There are some plants that, uh, that do that. Um, we're also going to look at um, uh, the way uh, leaves may vary in pattern. And so uh, the first thing I want to do is look at uh, the, some of the two basic different uh, groups of leaves, which we've seen earlier when we were studying um, uh, vascular plants and the evolution of leaves. The root uh, P-H-Y-L-L or fill uh, does mean leaf, so microfill would mean small leaves, and these are typical of plants found in the phylum Lycophyta. These are commonly called the club mosses, uh, although they're not true mosses. Uh, and I put a picture of them here. These are the ones that uh, we saw in the lab earlier. They produce these cone-like structures at the top called stroboli, but they have small leaves, and the characteristic about that leaf is that uh, it's just going to have a single vein of vascular tissue and then a little bit of fleshy extensions broadening it out just a little bit uh, whereas the megafills uh, these are found in all the other uh, uh, plant groups uh, and these are uh, sometimes also called eufills which actually translates to true leaves uh, and uh, here most other plants would have uh, true leaves uh, and here we're talking about vascular plants of course so if we look uh, more specifically at a kind of vascular plant called the eudicots, um, and the eudicots, uh, their leaves have these uh, typical kind of broad type of uh, leaf structure. Uh, they're going to have a uh, broad and flat, and they're going to have this net-like uh, or complex pattern of veins that you can see there within the leaf. Um, so um, this would be more typical of uh, the eudicot. Uh, and uh, you can see how it's attached here at the node and, and the petiole that attaches to the branch there. Uh, this is a little side note uh, or, or side discussion in the textbook uh, dealing with how uh, uh, the plant determines which side of the leaf is which. Uh, for example, uh, how does the plant uh, grow uh, the um, guard cells on the bottom of the leaf uh, and how does it know to do that? Like how does it know to vary one side from the other? Uh, so this is a little side note on that. I'm not going to spend time explaining it, but I encourage you to read over it just for enrichment. Uh, so we're going to move on to uh, cover more of the leaf structure here. So there are also structures um, that are grown from the, the petiole of the leaf. At the petiole, where the leaf meets the uh, uh, the branch where it grew from. Uh, at the petiole, um, and this is the, the stem here, the petiole uh, may have these little, uh, uh, two little structures going off to the side there. Those are also, those are called stipules. And the stipules may form leaf-like structures. They may also form uh, spine-like structures, and we might uh, refer to them as thorns, and they're grown there at, at the base uh, of the petiole. And they, they're in pairs, uh, the stipules are. Uh, veins, uh, venation is, uh, or the network of veins within the plant can also uh, vary here. Monocots are typically going to have um, a parallel vein, so you can see the veins running parallel along the leaf. And examples like grasses in the grass family, the eudicots are going to have a more complex network of veins. Uh, and in fact, in the lab, we covered uh, two kinds there's the pinnate uh, type of venation, and then there's the palmate. Uh, and the difference is based on how many main uh, veins the plant has. It's going to be pinnate if you have one main vein and then branches coming off. So the image there you see at the top of this slide there, that would be a pinnate uh, venation. Whereas palmate, you're going to have several main veins and they all seem to connect at the same, uh, at the same location. Those may have themselves branchings from their smaller branchings of veins. But overall, the major uh, vein structures uh, of vascular tissue uh, 
uh, have this palmate uh, pattern in there. And then uh, we have different kinds of uh, leaves when it comes to whether they're simple or compound. Uh, in a simple leaf, uh, it's going to have one uh, blade, and the blade is complete. So I'm circling around one uh, leaf there. Now the edge or the margin of the leaf may be uh, simple and just straight, or it may be lobed, like in this case. In some cases, some edges maybe have a serrated type with these teeth-like structures. Uh, but it, either way, it's uh, basically one blade, a complete blade, and that would be considered a simple leaf. Whereas other uh, plants may have um, a compound situation where the blade is actually divided into smaller leaflets. So this, is an, this would be an entire leaf, and each one of these little uh, leaflets there uh, make up this compound leaf. Uh, so uh, if we look at, uh, at the, the, the structure of the leaf uh, from the inside uh, and look at uh, the, the different uh, parts of the leaf, we can see how the construction of the leaf uh, is built for both photosynthesis and for allowing the leaf to ex uh, exchange gases with the atmosphere uh, overall. And, and uh, one of the exchanges includes the loss of water from the leaves through the stomata underneath. So what are uh, some of the ways the leaf is constructed to uh, provide the most efficient way of exchange without losing way too much water? Uh, so first of all, the leaf is going to be covered with epidermal cells. And for the most part, most of these epidermal cells, that single layer of cells is, uh, is transparent. Uh, they may have little or no chloroplasts there. And then this epidermis is going to secrete this waxy cuticle, which is made of a substance called cutin. Uh, and uh, that's going to also help prevent water loss. There are going to be other structures on the leaf surface, including uh, gland, glands that secrete uh, substances and hair-like structures called trichomes, which we saw in an earlier section. Uh, and then on the bottom of the leaf, you're going to have stomata, which are little holes and these holes are, are uh, bounded, or the boundary around them are by two guard cells, which control the opening and closing of the uh, stomata. And so if we look uh, more closely, and, and we saw these earlier already, uh, um, we're recovering the, the different tissues and looking at, ep at the epidermal cells. These uh, guard cells, we're looking here at the bottom, these guard cells, uh, there's two of them, uh, and they open and close uh, in response to the environmental conditions. If it's too hot and not enough water, these cells will close and close up the opening of the stoma uh, there. Um, and in times when uh, it's not so hot and there's uh, plenty of water availability, these um, cells will uh, open up and allow for more efficient gas exchange. So what we have here is we have a cross section uh, through the leaf as uh, going, going right through a gar the guard cell. So if we cut right through here and then look at it from the side, there's uh, what it would look like. So this would be the outside of, this, of the leaf and then going into the leaf over here where we have uh, the inner portion of the leaf called the mesophyll. And so uh, the mesophyll literally means or translates into middle of the leaf. And uh, we're going to we look more specifically at eudicots and monocots and for the most part emphasize more the the eudicot when we see in, 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 in an illustration here. Uh, so when we look at a eudicot leaf, there's two regions uh, with uh, in the mesophyll. Uh, the uh, top part of, of the inside of the leaf is the palisade mesophyll. Palisade is like a wall-like structure. So here you have tightly packed cells, with, and it, so it looks like this wall of cells that have chloroplasts, uh, so they're photosynthetic. So they're going to give this kind of parenchyma or ground tissue a very specific name. The parenchyma, they call it chlorenchyma cells, then it's just a kind of ground tissue that does photosynthesis. Uh, the other, the lower uh, region of the, of the mesophyll, of the eudicot leaf, is going to have spongy mesophyll. Uh, and there, there's uh, loosely packed cells in there where there's uh, air spaces within there. And so that's going to actually help with the gas exchange of the atmosphere. Since the stomata are onto the bottom, you're going to have that spongy mesophyll underneath. When it comes to the monocot leaves, the monocots uh, don't have a distinction between palisade and spongy. So when, when we looked at a cross section through a grass leaf or a monocot leaf, uh, what we tended to see was no palisade, but more like a spongy type of mesophyll in there. So when we look at this next picture here, this is going to be a picture of a section, a cross section through a, uh, a eudicot leaf. And you can see the ideal diagram on the right 
But here on the left, the top layer of cells, that's your epidermis. And uh, then you have your lower epidermis down here. And there you have, right down here, you have two guard cells in cross section. You can see the opening or the stoma. Here's another one right here. Uh, and then right there in the lower area, this region right here, that's your spongy mesophyll. Uh, so it's indicated here by this label. And there you can see the air spaces in between some of the photosynthetic cells. And you can see some cross section through some veins which uh, contain xylem and phloem. And then the, the top region of the mesophyll is where you have the wall of cells, sometimes one or uh, sometimes two layers of these photosynthetic cells. And so that's your palisade mesophyll. So the mesophyll here is where all of your photosynthetic uh, cells are all together uh, overall. Now the reason why this doesn't look green is because when uh, they sectioned to prepare the specimen, they did stain it and they stained it with stains that make this look uh, more red to, so we can have better contrast to see the cells in there. Uh, and so now we're going to look at modified leaves and uh, uh, there are certain other kinds of leaves uh, that uh, have certain uses. Uh, there are some plants that would produce leaves called bracts. Uh, another, uh, that's a fancy name for floral leaves. And here, these leaves surround an actual flower and uh, sort of function as the role of a colorful petal uh, to sort of attract pollinators. Uh, we, uh, we do have uh, certain landscaping plants that use run here that have these bracts. For example, the, the bougainvillea uh, plant uh, has these burgundy or reddish colored bracts. Uh, and then uh, another kind of modified leaf we saw earlier with the cactus on the cladophylls, uh, the flattened stems that actually do the photosynthesis, the leaves have become very reduced and very spiny or prickly. Uh, and that reduction of, uh, in the leaf is an adaptation to reduce water. Uh, and since they're spiny, that also helps reduce predation or uh, herbivores from coming and eating uh, the pads on the cactus, for example. Uh, and then there's uh, reproductive leaves and the reproductive leaves uh, are like little plantlets that uh, if they are uh, scattered away from the plant can grow into full-size plant. Uh, another kind of modified leaf would be a uh, window leaves and these are uh, typical of uh, succulent uh, type uh, plants. These are plants that store a lot of water uh, and the leaves are cone-shaped and this allows light to pass uh, further underground, so photosynthesis can actually take place underground as the light travels uh, through the leaf further down uh, under, the gr under the ground level. And then we have shade leaves and then insectivorous leaves. For the shade leaves, I don't have an image of them, but if you're in the shade, say on the bottom of the forest floor where you have a canopy of trees right above you, you're going to need to grab as much the sunlight that's left after it's passed through those trees above you as you can. So these shade leaves are actually going to be much broader uh, and large in surface area. Uh, so those will become um, uh, what would grow uh, in the in the dense uh, in the um, in the area where there's not a lot of a lot of light there underground. And then we have insectivorous leaves uh, here, and there's a, a, a sort of the connection between these types of plants and a poor nitrogen in the soil. So what these types of leaves uh, have evolved to do is actually capture or trap uh, uh, little animals like insects uh, and then digest them down so they can get the nitrogen from the proteins uh, and uh, nucleic acids found within the cells of these animals. Uh, and examples include the pitcher plant, uh, sundews, and the Venus flytrap. And I went in and took, took an image that had a composite of some of these types of, of plants here. Here at the top you see top right you see an example of a Venus flytrap. So when a flytrap uh, travels inside here, uh, attracted by uh, certain odors, uh, the two leaves close shut, trapping the insect in there, and then the, the insect dies and becomes digested in there. Pitcher plants, on the other hand, uh, have this sort of vase-shaped structure. There's uh, several of them in this photo here. There's a few pitcher plants there. And these pitcher plants uh, the insect goes down there, falls in there, and then gets trapped in a, in a, a fluid uh, there on the bottom and then dies and then, then gets digested and uh, the plant absorbs those uh, nutrients from it. And then sundews are going to produce these structures. Uh, I don't know if I see any in here. Uh, but they're going to produce like a sticky mucousy substance that traps the insect and then uh, uh, digests it down and absorbs the nutrients in that way.
So these are fascinating plants and uh, just uh, one other example of an, an adaptation uh, for the survival of these plants.